Good morning, friends. This is Steve, and today we're in the uh, Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, uh, Pigeon Forge to be particular. And I just wanted to show you before we started that there are crazier fools than I when it comes to getting out in bad weather. So yesterday was in the 70s. This morning is in the 20s, and we've had uh, supposedly between an inch and three inches of snow. I'd say it's more on the inch. But um, yeah, these crazy fools that are camper camping. Oh, and I don't know if you can see it, but over there, there are kids playing on the playground equipment and swinging in the snow. Uh, and there's the heated swimming pool. I've already seen people in it this morning. So, you, you can uh, still berate me for my getting out in the weather, but, um, yeah, uh, today we are going to stay in this nice sheltered um, balcony. We've been exploring the message to the Laodiceans, and I want to kind of reframe today because we've been looking at truths that may not be accurate. The first is that to be a hot Christian, you um, need to have evangelistic fervor. And I'd like to redescribe that. Evangelism breaks the world down into two groups, those who are in and those who are not. And evangelistic fervor means we feel the drive to bring those who are outside, inside, to bring them inside the circle of acceptance. Now, I'm not arguing against that. I'm just pointing that out. But evangelism is not what defines Christ's disciples. Love is. Love that includes our enemies. Love that includes the people who are on the outside of that circle of acceptance. The second um, fallacy, if you would have that, uh, is defense of the truth. Once again, I'm not saying that defending the truth is not necessary. But when we use that to define ourselves as spiritual, we run into a fallacy. Because defending the truth is the reverse of evangelism. We still divide the world into outside, inside. We still draw a circle. But now instead of trying to draw people in, we are pushing people out of the circle of acceptance. The third fallacy we've explored, last week I labeled obedience, accountability. What's false about accountability? What's false about obedience? Well, we still end up drawing a circle. Those on the outside are disobedient, those on the inside are obedient. And I pointed out to you last week that while God is the judge, he's also our father. And he is doing everything he can to empower us. So, where do we go from here? When Vivian and I were in our 20s, I already told you we went to Indonesia to teach English. While there, I gave birth to my first kidney stone. Uh, <clears throat> I've given birth to nine or ten more since then, but there's something about your first birthing that is dramatic, especially if you're 20-something and feeling invincible and all of a sudden you're rolling on the floor in uncontrollable pain. <clears throat> so we went to a hospital and I got a shot of morphine and the pain resolved. But the doctor decided that he wanted to do some tests 
to determine if there were more stones up there ready to drop. That required a series of doctor's visits. And one day in the waiting room of the doctor, I met one of my English students. And he had with him his wife and children. Now, I love children, okay? Um, <laughs> Vivian says, uh, I'm still 90% child inside. You know, I honk in tunnels and uh, bark at dogs and, well, <clears throat> not when Vivian's around, okay? But, um, yeah, children and I get along. And so we're in the waiting room and I start teasing and playing with the children and I see my students starting to get more and more anxious. And finally he says, uh, Mr. Steve, uh, it would be better if you didn't do that. They're sick. They have, and he said, used an Indonesian word that I didn't understand. And he saw my confusion. So he tried to translate and still in Indonesian, he said, they have a childhood sickness. Well, <clears throat> I'm an American. I'm 20-something, and yes, I just gave birth to a kidney stone, but I'm still feeling invulnerable, so I reassured him, I've had all my shots, and continued playing with the children. I didn't think anything of it. Um, but a week later, I started feeling puny again. Not the pain of a, ch of a kidney stone, but... Uh, just weak and feverish. Uh, saw the doctor again. He did some tests and diagnosed malaria, which was not uncommon. Um, but I didn't improve with the malarial medications. In fact, I continued to get worse. And finally, the decision was made to send me home to the States. To, uh, we were nearing the end of our stay there anyway, and they decided to send us home a month or so early. Uh, so that I could get medical care. They had to, actually had to carry me onto the plane. And the, the crew on the plane were just wonderful. They brought me blankets while we were on the plane. We had an unexpected layover at one stop, and they actually rented a hotel room and took me in a wheelchair to the hotel and let me lay down there for six hours instead of sitting in the airport with everyone else. We made it all the way across the Pacific, got to family in Seattle, and they immediately rushed me to an emergency room. <clears throat> and my wife tell the, tells the story. I was not really with it. She tells the story that they made the decision to admit me because they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And the doctor I was assigned was a new internal medicine specialist. He had just finished his training <clears throat> less than a year before, and he came in all excited because he got a tropical disease case. And he was wringing his hands and tell, reassuring Vivian, we're going to get to the bottom of this. If we have to, we'll call in other experts, but we're going to get to the bottom of this for you. Well, they put me in the hospital, and uh, I slept through the night. But the next morning, I started shaking, and I mean violently shaking, shaking so badly that the bed was bouncing up and down, and I wasn't holding on to it. I mean, I was just bouncing in the bed because I was shaking so hard. In medical terms, it's called rigors, and I had a severe case of rigors, and my roommate called the nurses and the nurses came in. They thought I was having a seizure. They called the doctor. The doctor came rushing in. They checked my, my vital signs and I had a temperature of 103. And the doctor said, no, it's not a seizure. Uh, so they gave me some Tylenol for my temperature, my fever. And um, next thing I remember is an infectious disease specialist coming in to see me. And he walked in, he stayed well away from me, asked me a couple of questions. One of which was, had I been exposed to any sick children? At which point I remembered my students' children in the waiting room. He nodded, twisted his mouth into a wry grimace of distaste, came over, asked me to open my mouth, and looked inside and walked out of the room. 
I mean, I was, I was kind of insulted, you know. He'd only asked me two or three questions. He'd stayed on the other side of the room like I was some leper. His examination had been perfunctory. Next thing I knew, the nurses rushed into the room and they wheeled, the, wheeled my roommate out of the room and got him out of there and put a quarantine sign on my door. The infectious disease specialist had quite easily diagnosed my condition by looking in my mouth. You see, measles, the first thing that you see on terms of physical exam are spots inside the mouth, even before the rash comes on. And he'd looked in my mouth, diagnosed measles. Well, measles, like COVID, is airborne. It spreads through the air. And it's one of the most contagious diseases we know of, which is why they immediately put these restrictions on and why the next day I was discharged from the hospital to go home to my, <laughs> to Vivian's family's home. 90% um, of the family vacated the home <laughs> and they didn't show up again for another two weeks. Uh, but it really wasn't traumatic for me because, you see, by this time, the measles had, had, I had broken out in the measles rash. And I was itching uncontrollably. Now, I've had itching before from, you know, mosquito bites, chiggers, nothing like measles. And I know, itching is not a serious condition, <laughs> unless you have it, and you want to scratch your skin off, okay? So, three times a day, Vivian would administer a dose of Benadryl. It turns out I'm quite sensitive to Benadryl in the fact that I go to sleep immediately. So she would wake me up, get me out of bed, take me down, feed me, take me to the bathroom, let me do my business, and then give me a dose of Benadryl once she had me back in bed, and I would sleep straight for another eight hours, at which point she would wake me up. This went on for two weeks. I'm very frustrated today because during those two weeks, Mount St. Helens was blowing its top and billowing smoke and ash and fire into the, into the atmosphere within sight of the house where I was. It was a safe distance, but I missed the eruption of Mount St. Helens because of measles. Or was it because of Benadryl? <sighs> One of the great losses in my life. Now, I had a very mild case of measles. All I had to do with it was itching. I didn't had, have to deal with measles pneumonia which has a 40% mortality. I didn't have to deal with measles encephalitis, where only 20% of people recover without brain damage. And what medication was I given for this serious disease that could kill or maim me for life? Benadryl and Tylenol. Benadryl for the itching, Tylenol for the fever. Because there is no treatment for measles, just like with COVID, there's no treatment that cures the disease, nothing like antibiotics. All that they were treating were the symptoms. They were keeping me comfortable while my body did the healing. I want to suggest to you today that when we talk about Laodicea and being lukewarm, what we usually focus on are the symptoms, the lack of love, the lack of unity, the lack of obedience. But all of those are just symptoms of the spiritual disease that has us in its grip. And when we treat the symptoms, we assume the disease is, will pass, that it's, we could recover. But if there's one thing the Bible teaches us, is that we can't recover from sin just by treating the symptoms. 
Jesus talked about the religious people of his day being whitewashed sepulchers, whitewashed on the outside. The symptoms were well treated, but full of dead men's bones on the inside. The disease was rampant. The message to the Laodiceans calls us to do more than treat the symptoms. Next week, we'll dive into what Revelation presents as the answer to the Laodicean condition. But in the meantime, friends, please stay warm, stay safe, be prudent, but above all, keep looking up.